Howdy, folks. <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Harm Reduction Report. It is the Harm Reduction Report. It is December 4th, a very snowy morning. Yeah, snow day today. Cal, you had class today, didn't you? Nope. It was canceled? It was canceled, yep. Wow. How did you make it all the way to my parents' house from downtown? Oh, luckily I have a uh, all-wheel drive vehicle, so I was trudging through the snow in my army tank of a car, <laughs> army tank of a truck. I was able to uh, make it through the slippery slopes, the ups and downs here in Grand Forks. But I did see uh, several several cars, you know, pulled over on the side of the road and needed needed help and off to get out there and help them on the way home. <laughs> on the <laughs> way <laughs> home, when they've frozen for a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be more. That's a good strategy. Well, uh, it's another episode of the Harm Reduction Report. What is the Harm Reduction Report, Cal? Yeah, so welcome to the Harm Reduction Report, uh, where we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty about... Uh, drug-related topics and, you know, uh, different harm reduction material, how to mitigate the risks involved in drug use and discussions of uh, sensible drug policy that can help society in general. So we have a a lot of different directions we can go Uh, in this episode. We're going to hear Frank. We're going to hear Frank. Yeah, we're going to hear from our advisor, Frank, and he was talking at a uh, an event called Thirsty for Justice Thursdays, hosted by Kylie Overson. So we'll uh, get into the recording and then do a little discussion afterwards. This is your friend Willard T. Belly with your pal Cal. Kylie Overson hosts this Thirsty for Justice Thursday seminars at the Christus Rex uh, Center on campus. And last week they did a talk the theme was about addiction so they had frank frank was there frank white the advisor of the und students for sensible drug policy and psychedelic club chapter frank was speaking about addiction as well as michael Dulitz, who was just newly hired by the city of grand forks public health to what's what's it as the opiate response project coordinator so they're doing things like hosting events and uh, talking about what to do about it. <laughs> what to do about it. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I expect usually a couple people are running late when they come to these events. Uh, but I've actually grown to like the smaller groups that we've had because it really allows us to have a good informal conversation about the events that we're discussing. And as Chad said, this series has been um, happening over the past year. Jane, I think you've been at almost every one. <laughs> so, and thank all you. Been so good. <laughs> um, and so we've discussed everything from healthcare and immigration to criminal justice reform and gender equality, domestic violence, and um, tonight we're really excited to have Michael and Frank join us to talk about addiction. Um, so this will be, I will have a few questions after we do introductions, but then we're just going to open it up to have some conversation. Um, knowing Will and Nate as I do, I know these are issues that you've been working on and are passionate about in our community, so I'm glad that you're here to participate as well. Uh, so to my right, Michael du- is it Dulitz? Dulitz, yeah. Dulitz is from the Grand Forks Public Health Department. He is the Opiate Response Project Coordinator. Um, just started earlier this month. Yeah. Masters in public health. Yes. Yep. yep. Which we're excited about. Yep. He previously worked at Essentia Health in Fargo, um, and also worked as a paramedic for six years. Um, as Jane said, he has his MPH from here at UND in health management and policy, and also has a bachelor's in sociology from Augustana College. Uh, Michael is passionate about identifying and addressing social and health gaps, and in his spare time, he's an avid traveler. Michael resides in Fargo right now with his wife Laura and their dog. So, thank you, Michael, for joining us. And Frank White, to my left, has been the last 30 years as a sociology professor at the University of North Dakota. Originally from Walhalla, he started his teaching career in 1982 at Lake Region Community College and was hired by UND in 1988. Frank currently teaches Introduction to Sociology, Social Problems, Drugs in Society, and Sociology of Sports. Frank was also a visiting professor at the American College of Norway and serves on their advisory council. He also sits on the board of directors of the Pemina Gorge Foundation and hosts the Frank White Golf Tournament and scholarship fundraiser held annually at the Walhalla Country Club. 
Through the years, White has earned numerous awards, including the UND Foundation Award for Professor of the Year, the UND Foundation Award for Academic Advisor of the Year, the Faculty Service Learning Award for Community Engagement, and the North Dakota Spirit Faculty Achievement Award. So thank you both. Thank you, Frank and Michael, for joining us. Um, and then I'm going to give each of you just a few minutes to talk a little bit about how you got into the work that you're doing as it relates to addiction and, and drug use and culture. And then we'll go from there. So Michael, if you want to start. Um, so getting into this, um, I, I started in healthcare when I was in high school, um, first as an EMT in my hometown, and then um, I became a paramedic shortly after I, um, or while I was working on my undergrad degree. Um, and over time, you know, addiction's always been something that's been talked about, and I you know, see it through two different lenses, the lens of the healthcare system, um, which is very negative about it, and the lens of the, you know, on the more academic side, you know, which has a lot different, um, a lot different opinion of addiction um, and it's been something that's always been kind of in conflict in my head uh, because I see addiction on a day-to-day -day basis um, working in healthcare and then you know I have my you know my beliefs um, you know formed in the academic realm so um, what really got me started on the, the um, on the opiate um, spectrum or working with uh, opiates is um, I did a project for my environmental health class a couple of years ago where I started looking at um, opiates because I, I was realizing that it's becoming a problem. Um, you know, people dropping, um, pushing people out of cars in front of hospitals that had experienced opioid overdoses. And, you know, we'd go out and save them and, um, you know, they would go drive away. And, you know, that, that's pretty scary. Um, so I did a project um, where I was looking at opiates and I, I immersed myself in the world of opiate use for a couple of weeks and I found wonderful um, online communities um, where, where people were very frank about their opiate use um, and I realized that you know it's a lot of really good people um, that are struggling with an addiction you know and that that just kind of helped reframe things in my head and you know and bring things from an academic realm into into my work in healthcare um, so um, since that project, my my work's been evolving. Um, but then recently, um, I got the opportunity to work with uh, Debbie Swanson. Um, uh, <coughs> North Dakota received some federal money, um, which was granted to um, to the four or five communities um, and three tribes in North Dakota. Um, Grand Forks being one of those communities, um, one hundred eighty thousand dollars focused on opiates. Um, so. Um, we're, we're working on building opiate infrastructure, um, treatment and prevention infrastructure. 20% um, of the money we received um, is, um, is catered towards prevention and 80% towards treatment. And um, as far as evidence-based treatment um, that's most effective, Grand Forks has no providers that, that really provide um, evidence-based um, treatment with medication-assisted therapy. Um, and, um, and peer support um, and a, a robust peer support infrastructure. So um, I saw an opportunity here and a position opened at Grand Forks Public Health. Um, and so I started on November 1st, but you know, the month before that, you know, I went back into my immersing myself into the world of, um, of opiate use. Um, and so, you know, I had my work during the day and then at night I'm, I'm learning from another perspective. So um, it's been, I, it's been a very much an immersion over the past um, past couple months, so I hope I can share some of those thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Frank? Uh, as Kelly mentioned, it's my 30th year at UND, and, and before that time I taught at Lake Region Community College for uh, six more years. So my 36th year and uh, my last year at the community college, I taught a class uh, in social problems, and a whole unit was spent on drug education totally fascinated with it as well back 36 years ago and uh, when you teach sociology and I, certainly when I came to UND I taught introduction to sociology social problems very broad based stuff uh, I had one uh, specific course called sociology of sport but most of them were very general you know statistics or methods but when I came here there was an opening uh, in our department to teach drugs in society and nobody wanted to do it the guy had retired and he was a tough guy to follow to Dr. Richard, Richard Wilsnack and his wife you probably know Sharon Milstack, I mean, 
they uh, team taught, they, they did everything in that area, PhDs out of Harvard, and not anybody wanted to follow that, but I was pretty excited about it at the time. I thought this could be an area I could kind of specialize in. I, I saw a niche there. And uh, for the next 30 straight years, I had no idea how much uh, work that would be to keep current on the, the changing drug climate. Uh, and I wanted to keep uh, current on the, the drugs that students in college were using in high school age too, because 90% of all the addictions, even today, 90% of prescription drug use starts in your teen years too. So I, I found that I researched, I immersed myself and I continually have spoken about it. And uh, not that I'm an expert, but with a 30 year perspective, I, I pretty much seen a lot of the major drugs, uh, both legal and illegal, uh, see them run their course too. You know, I go back to you know, the late 1980s with methamphetamine, you know, that, that ice age they were talking about as that came across the, the state and, and peaked and subsided, well, the bath salts, the synthetic drugs in the 1990s. And then today uh, we're starting to see the, the opiate, uh, the synthetic drugs that have superseded everything. There's more people dying from illicit uh, painkillers, not illicit, but uh, we call offline people getting uh, diversionary tactics to use those drugs. And uh, it's uh, uh, killing more people and young people than uh, all the car accidents and all the other drugs combined, heroin and cocaine or whatever. So um, I made a point to go and speak to high schools over that 30 years on whatever the drug choice they asked me. And I pretty much let them decide you know, they got a pretty good feel on the, the pulse of what drugs they like to hear. And they asked me, could you come in and do this drug, this drug? And recently, the last couple of years, I'm getting these requests to speak on opiates. Uh, opioids, I'll uh, talk about the two different, same term, but uh, uh, but it, it, is the, uh, it is the drug of choice of the millennials. Uh, and uh, all the problems associated with it, and uh, whether it's uh, law enforcement or education or parenting, uh, there's a lot to know out there too. And, and I'll mention one other thing too, when you have these epidemics, uh, you know, in the beginning of the, the epidemic, like whether it be meth or be opiates, is that the use, you know, is gonna peak because a lot of the negative consequences aren't out there yet. Uh, people don't know enough about this. A after it runs its peak, like we've seen with bath salts and, and meth, there's still problems, but they're not the same thing because we get education out there, we get some research, we get quality speakers, we get a, 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 an organization like yourself and funding to go and, uh, get the community more aware of that too. So I'm seeing that right now with the opioids. We're at that peak, it's it's an epidemic, it's uh, it's something we need to address. And I don't know if we're doing as much when it comes to the funding. You're, you're talking about, you, you might not be funded in April 15th, you know. Mm -hmm. This, you know, what it's doing to our young people, what it's doing to professionals, uh, I don't know how they cannot get on it. And in the beginning of an epidemic, that's where you want two things. You want drug awareness, you want to get more information out there. Whatever literature is there, if you're doing what I'm doing, get that out there as soon as possible, and also work with the law enforcement. You know, it's uh, you're not going to rush yourself out of the problem. You're not going to educate yourself out of the problem. But you've got to get those working together and uh, and get the information out there to show the consequences and get uh, ahead of the curve. And uh, I'd like to think that I'm uh, doing part of that uh, with my class, with my high school visits, and with the students that go out and uh, talk about that uh, topic in their uh, work and in their families. Thank you. And you were in that class. I was in that class. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you a follow-up question right away, Frank. Um, when we're looking at what we would classify as an epidemic, there's been maybe for the last five years in the media in North Dakota and across the country a lot of conversation about this epidemic. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is that maybe this isn't Maybe it's overblown? Is this a, a trend that we've seen before with other drugs or is this something that's a step above the other epidemics we've seen? No, I don't think it's overblown at all. Uh, if anything, I don't think we have enough of our resources and educators out there talking about it. Um, I think it's kind of come upon us very quickly. Uh, if you look at the literature, uh, uh, we talk about heroin and, uh, and fentanyl and all those uh, uh, illicit uh, drugs out there, prescription, but illicit as far as people using them. We're seeing now that uh, people are getting started on prescription drugs and that's leading them to street heroin. We've never seen it before, you know, and it's it's relatively recent, it's relatively new, and the anti has went up quite a bit too because these are so powerful. Uh, and people don't realize too, when you talk about the, uh, the epidemic, uh, when, you, when you think about the word epidemic and what it's used, you know, epidemic basically means, you know, uh, epa means upon or, or around. Endemic is the people. And what you're seeing is that the epidemic is really around uh, a specific population of younger people people that aren't very knowledgeable, people that think that they're invulnerable. And this generation has the uh, option of the internet that a, a previous one or 20 years ago, we didn't have that. We didn't even talk about this 15 years ago. 
that they have now and the dark web that uh, maybe parents don't know what a lot of kids are talking about with that as well too. So when I look at that epidemic, I see it as, as a key key concern and I don't know if we're getting uh, the information out there as much as we should because uh, you got a drug and what's kind of thing about the drug and you'll hear about this. When you see people die from these drugs or you know uh, the addiction or the treatment or whatever, you know, if you get street drugs, you know, from the internet, you, if you get something that's low purity, you know, that can kill you too, you know, uh, just because it's not what you thought you were taking. And if you get stuff that's high purity, that can kill you as well too. We've never seen drugs that could do that before. And then now people are starting to dab, you know, some of the stuff with, with fentanyl that has a uh, hundred times the potency of, of a lot of the most powerful prescription drugs too. That's a dangerous game of Russian roulette. And, uh, Students don't know it, so you can guarantee that a lot of parents don't know that. And I would just, I just spoke to several high schools uh, on this very issue for, for this last uh, five-week period. And I asked every one of the students, these are seniors now, have anyone have ever had a, a drug education class in college, in high school yet? Not one. Nobody's talked to you about the, the D.A.R.E. project in grade school? No. And I'm thinking that because of uh, budget shortcuts, uh, because of the emphasis on that too, I think that's one of the things that gets cut is education awareness. and. Uh, I think it's, when you talk about justice, I think it's criminal that you have an epidemic like of this uh, with high school and the internet uh, options, and there's not someone speaking out there. The law enforcement is more involved in this too, and we're not seeing more of this on television as well. I just, I'm just surprised by the, the nonchalance. So I think it's offset. I think we're under, as, as a society, underestimating that and uh, its impact. Okay. Like, I guess for context, when I was in the legislature, I, I served on the Human Services Committee. So we addressed addiction and mental health and behavioral health services in the state of North Dakota. So I, from the perspective of available services in the state, I understand how woefully unprepared we are and how underserviced we are across the state, especially in rural areas. Yeah, um, you're, you're right, especially in rural areas. If you look at the war on drugs too, you look at that $25 billion budget every year, you know, most of it goes to the law enforcement and uh, the rest of us fight for the education of the awareness and uh, harm reduction, which is another option, zero. You know, I, I, we don't have a drug czar anymore. <laughs> right. Trump's going to uh, appoint one soon, but the person he wanted uh, dropped out. But I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, way underplayed here too, and the national and the needs at the rural and the, and the, and the, and the college. Sure. It's just the same. Michael, um, you were talking about immersing yourself into opiate use in the community. Tell us more about what that means and what you were doing. So, when you think about immersing yourself, you really want to know what um, you know what path someone really took to you know to start using opiates. You want to know how they're going about um, their opiate use. You know, sourcing. Um, you know how they are using um, you know there's a there's a whole variety of ways that people use and they start at one um, you know they start with you know things like pills and you know or or you know either um, legitimately prescribed or diverted um, pills and then they move down this continuum as the um, as the opiate starts to or as the addiction becomes stronger and stronger and then they move on to you know snorting um, you know which you know, people feel okay with it, you know, okay, I'm going to snort and, you know, this isn't bad, you know, I'm, I'm, I got this under control and then they move down to, um, you know, they'll move into the world of uh, what they call plugging, um, you know, which is taking drugs through the rear end, um, you know, because that bypasses your liver and then, um, you know, eventually in that realm they'll end up moving towards um, things like um, heroin as the, the cost of, um, as the cost of prescription drugs diverted or, you know, legitimate, you know, that supply either gets too expensive or um, too, um, or unavailable, you know, then they move into the world of heroin. Um, and so, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on, um, on basically the red, uh, the opiate board on Reddit. Um, I don't know if there's any Redditors in here or not. Um, and, you know, there's this, this isolation that people talked about when, um, when they, um, are addicted to opiates or have opiate use disorder. Um, there's this isolation from people that they know, and so really this underground community develops, and you know that's what people really 
lean upon. And so that's where a lot of these harm reduction initiatives and stuff have started, you know, are people that are concerned about, you know, about each other. And, you know, you talk to someone that's using, um, or that has like an opiate use disorder where the addiction has become a significant part of their life. And, you know, they tell people who are, you know, starting to use or are casually using, you know, they, you know, they tell them to stop, you know, they don't want people to go through what they're going through. Um, and another thing that's really, um, you know, that I've gleaned from um, this is that it kind of becomes, you know, once once the addiction is taken over, you're using opiates to not go through, into withdrawal. So um, that's the difference with um, with opiates is that the withdrawal symptoms are so intense um, they won't kill you, but they're very intense, and so you. You're basically you're going from day to day avoiding withdrawal versus getting you know a high or a rush or anything like that you know so your your mind it it's um, sometimes taken akin to like a hunger or thirst um, so you're you're just working to get that next um, amount of um, of your opioid so you don't feel like you're or so you aren't in withdrawal so um, you know when you think about what people do um, to get to basically to score to get their opiates you know they're they're basically trying to you know meet their needs in whatever way possible because it, you know they feel you know just like a hunger or thirst you know it's you know when you're hungry thirsty you do things that you wouldn't normally do and it's just along those lines so you know really understanding that that whole continuum is what i mean with immersing the immersing myself in that world so if I could add to that too, because yeah. you're, you're absolutely right, I'm, I'm spot on there too. With, uh, with the opiates, which is different from a lot of other addictions as well too, is that they call that the yin and yang approach where, where people ask, how can those people possibly be you know, hooked on heroin? Why wouldn't they just stop that? Well, one, there's that psychological addiction too, you know, that good, good feeling, but after you do it for a while, you talk about addiction, if you use it for a long period of time, is that you don't get the high more because you built up a tolerance for it. Mm -hmm. And most people at the end of their careers or in the height of that, uh, that drug here is that they're taking the drug not to uh, to get high anymore or to feel good it's to prevent that withdrawal or that getting sick what they call being dope sick yep. and uh, when it comes to opiates or painkillers uh, the lady speaking of my class she doesn't like the word painkiller because you never kill the pain but pain relievers when you um, when you take those the withdrawal from painkillers or opiates is much more physical than it is the other drugs like LSD or PCB, which is more psychological or hallucinogenic. Mm -hmm. And I'm told by people that went through that withdrawal process and with the medical health uh, uh, community is that uh, that is a pain almost worse than death. They'll do almost anything to prevent that withdrawal uh, when it comes to you know, taking heroin or fentanyl or methadone or whatever the case happens to be. And that's why people end up, um, or that's one of the things that contributes to overdose is that um, you become so physically sick of the, the cycle that you you start to use more in hopes that maybe you won't wake up um, because it's just taken over your life that much. Um, the other the other thing is with um, your traditional addiction type um, treatment programs is there um, many of them are oriented towards abstinence. So you know you drink a lot or you know you have an um, alcohol use disorder. Or alcoholism you quit drinking you know we help you quit drinking we help you through the withdrawal and then we um, we help you um, beyond that and you you can eventually get back to a relatively normal um, state you know with opiates um, abstinence based therapy or abstinence based um, treatment programs only have about a 10 percent chance of succeeding um, because they it changes the chemistry of your brain essentially um, your mu receptors which are your um, what the opiates act upon, um, you know, you have so many of them that you can never um, satisfy those receptors with, with what they call the endogenous opioids, the opioids that are already within your body. So you're constantly craving, um, and so you, you know, a lot of people end up you know, leaving and using right away, and then you know when you um, you lose your tolerance, and then they use the normal amount and. So one of the, the times that a person's most likely to overdose is when, after they've left an abstinence-based therapy program mm -hmm. or jail. So. so tell us more about what you are doing with this project with Grand Forks Public Health. And if that, is this a new program altogether or is it focus shifting? Um, so with our program, um, we have created, um, you know, part of this program, it's informed by the mayor's call to action. Um, 
the mayor's call to action uh, steering committee is um, is the oversight for this grant. Um, and so they identified um, through their committee work um, different areas that, to focus on. And so I'm using that as kind of a template, um, as well as, you know, the state wants to see evidence-based interventions. Um, and, and the point, you know, with the 2080 or 8020 um, is to really develop a robust um, treatment infrastructure in Grand Forks. Um, so, um, so you're going to see, you know, in the coming, you know, months, you're going to see a lot of talk about prevention and you're going to see us going out into the community and, you know, equipping people with Narcan, um, and training them on, uh, Narcan, naloxone, the opioid antidote drug. But, you know, what's really going to, you know, a large part of our work is developing that recovery infrastructure. Um, so we're working with. Uh, Valley Community Health Center to develop a medication-assisted treatment program. Um, this medication-assisted treatment program would be able to provide um, Suboxone or prescribed Suboxone, which is um, uh, buprenorphine. Um, it's a partial agonist um, to this new opioid receptor, so um, it basically helps you avoid withdrawal. Um, it blocks those receptors um, in your brain, helps you avoid withdrawal and um, avoid the cravings for um, for opiates. Um, so that's going to be one part of it. Um, and then they also have a kind of a counseling infrastructure there that they're developing as well. Um, the other part that we're working on actively right now is um, supporting individuals who are already receiving uh, medication assisted therapy. Um, so there are, there's a number of people, the closest um, Suboxone prescribers in Thief River Falls. Um, and then in um, Fargo. So a lot of people are either going to, uh, to Thief River Falls or to Fargo. And then a number of people from the Grand Forks area are also driving down to Fargo to receive methadone treatment. Um, you know, between four or five people right now are driving um, to receive methadone treatment. And a methadone treatment program is very highly regulated and it's very, um, it's kind of a challenging thing to do from a distance. So, um, it requires methadone's a long-acting opiate, and it has a high abuse potential. So it's regulated, and you have to um, when you start out in a program, you have to do in-person dosing. So you have to have someone watching you, you take a dose of methadone um, six days a week um, for three months. Um, you're, and then you have one take-home dose for it to cover Sunday. Um, so you're having to drive back and forth from Grand Forks to Fargo um, at you know, six in the morning, um, you know, there's three hours that you can get a dose um, a day. You, so you're driving at six in the morning to get your dose to drive back and if you're working, you know, to get back in time. Um, and so, you know, that the economic cost is huge um, in just, um, in that, just in gas, you know, much less your time. Um, but the methadone treatment programs are also um, considered kind of a gold standard because they include um, physician oversight or a medical provider oversight. They include counseling um, at least once per month. Um, and they include that um, accountability in that um, you have a, a nurse looking at you every day and you know they can tell if you start, started using again and you know, then they can help you get into the counselor um, or you know, to the provider, um, change your dose or um, whatever it takes. So. Um, so another component of what we're doing is we're um, we're providing a travel program to help offset some of the, the cost. Um, we're we're providing a, a little bit of uh, monetary help through um, through gift cards to um, individuals who are driving back and forth, um, both in Grand Forks and it's a program available to anyone in uh, Northeast uh, North Dakota that's driving back and forth. Um, and then finally, um, one of the other things that we're working on currently is exploring the idea of um, a medication unit for a suboxone or for a methadone clinic in Grand Forks. So people wouldn't have to drive six days a week. They'd have to drive to Fargo occasionally for um, some of their treatment, but then they wouldn't have to drive six days a week. Um, on the prevention side, um, we're working on increasing that access to Narcan, um, the, the opioid reversal drug. Um, 
so right now, you know, we've been working with the schools, the library, um, and the university, um, and so by the end of uh, January, all three entities um, will be carrying Narcan in some way, shape, or form. Um, and then we're also um, working on um, exploring other harm reduction techniques. Um, uh, we've applied for a, a small grant to do a needs assessment um, for uh, like a syringe service program. Um, there, there's a syringe service program right now that's just starting in Mandan. There's been one in Moorhead um, that's been around for a very long time and there'll soon be one in Fargo, but we're, we want to explore the need um, for that in Grand Forks. Um, and then the other thing is that um, education aspect. Um, I've been fortunate in my position that there's been a lot of community education going on in the past um, in the past year and a half, two years, three years, and that um, these conversations that I'm having to implement some of my work um, it's become so much easier. And so every time that we talk about this, and we talk about it in the manner of uh, um, addiction as a long-term disease and something that we need to work together to fix, um, we're getting one step closer to um, destigmatizing addiction. So um, we're working on another community event next month um, where we'll view a documentary um, and then have a, another panel discussion. And then we also want to have a speaker to talk about it from an economic perspective too because um, we want to work on engaging employers um, in the business community to realize the impact that opiates are having on their um, on their day to day as well. Ho hopefully that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, no, I think it's important for us to know what is happening mm -hmm. to address this. And I, you know, I'm curious, I guess, from either of you, maybe from your long history of, of seeing this, is medication assisted treatment a relatively new approach to addiction? Or is it is it dependent on the clearly dependent on the type of drugs that we're using? But well, usually I'm long kind of alcohol then and abuse, you know, methadones, mm -hmm. uh, the new ones, uh, sub subloxone, suboxone. Yeah, I always get that, that in trouble with that one. But uh, we've often had that too. But in the, in the educational perspective, we we want to say that you know some people argue that you're you know not getting your uh, never you're replacing one drug with another drug because you're talking about six days a week too with the mm -hmm. expense and. And some of the uh, so we, we, we understand the the, um, uh, the importance of that too, but we'd like to keep that in line with the behavioral aspect as well too. The education, um, you know, alternative training. You know, some people get the Eastern spiritualism exercise and other things as well too. But a combination of that as well too. So it's yeah, it's been around for a long time, and uh, and it's hand in hand medical community with, with behavioral sciences and. And that's probably the best approach. When you have a complex issue like that, you want the different disciplines coming in and working together. Uh, for too many years, uh, I've seen where it became like a one-legged stool. Uh, it was law enforcement. You know, we thought we could arrest ourselves without a problem. You can't do that. You know, it's it's too big a problem. But with the medical community, the education community, the treatment facilities, um, uh, the the chemical uh, treatment. Uh, Methadone, it's like that. If you put that together, you have a four-legged stool, much more sturdy and, and much better chance of going after a comprehensive uh, a problem that keeps evolving and adapting. Methadone has been around since the 70s. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then Suboxone has been um, buprenorphine since the 90s. Yeah. So. Okay. So Frank, from your perspective, you know, having worked with the population that you've been working with, college students primarily, what what have you seen as a shift in perspective on how we view drugs and how we view addiction and the stigma around that? Yeah, uh, you know, there's always the mainstay drugs. You know, the, I've been here. As a, I was here as a student in the in the '70s, so uh, saw the alcohol. You know, the binge drinking. Uh, that's still here. That's a, that hasn't changed. Uh, marijuana was a concern then. It's a concern now. Uh, with marijuana now, you can throw in the synthetic marijuana. You can throw in uh, the new stuff that's a little more powerful, like hashish and the different routes of administration, how to take that. That's a concern, but it's, I think it's even a bigger concern. The marijuana is more powerful today than the stuff we took, you know, the addicting aspect and things like that as well. So uh, we're seeing those mainstays, but I'm seeing a shift in drugs too. And um, from talking with students and doing my own interviewing and uh, and research on there, uh, the new drugs of concern uh, on college campuses and of course the high school campuses, um, Adderall uh, and Ritalin right off the bat, you know, and and for reasons you know, are kind of interesting too. You know, a lot of students think that you know they call them smart drugs. You know, I can I can study all night long, eight hours, and and we had Vibrant, we had coffee, we did that stuff too. 
Uh, but uh, when you go to prescription drug, when you go to major stimulant like, like Adderall or Ritalin or Concerta, you know, a, the handful of uh, prescription drugs, you know, students are using the study and they don't always realize this either is that, you know, uh, sometimes it'll keep you awake, you know, but you might not be able to concentrate on studying. Some of you will end up cleaning their apartment for eight hours a night too. So <laughs> we're seeing that a lot. So there's no sitting that I think is a smart pill, but they're using it. And they're also using it quite a bit now too. They combine it with alcohol so you can drink longer, you can party longer. You know, they're working 40 hours a week. They're taking 18 credits. They, they start to party at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and they want to go till four in the morning. They're, they're and you're combining two, you know, a major stimulant drug with a, a stip with a depressant drug. That's a dangerous combination as well, too. So we're seeing that with the with the stimulant drugs, but we're really seeing a lot of uh, of the prescription painkillers. That Vicodin and uh, and um, uh, which would be hydrocodone and uh, oxycodone, um, man, the, the the fentanyl we're seeing now uh, out there as well. The opioids, you know, the synthetic painkillers, the powerful stuff. Uh, we're seeing more and more that on campus. And, and students tell me too, it's easier to get a, an Adderall pill than it is to get a beer on campus now. Uh, with the prescriptions and, and uh, they tell me, they, they're pretty honest with me too. They say, no, Craig, the doctors aren't always trained in uh, behavioral uh, therapy. So you can go there and tell me, you know, I have this bad back, I have this pain, you know, and you can get that. And I was gonna uh, share, uh, add to one of your answers where, as well too earlier, we talked about addiction is that the, the stuff is so powerful today for young kids. The younger you start, you know, the, the less developed your brain is, you know, it takes about age 20, 29 to have a fully developed, you know, mature brain. It's like a, they say it's like a uh, set in cement before it gets hard. Uh, when you start using drugs, binge drinking or, or powerful synthetic drugs, heroin, we talk about that, that opioid and that dopamine release, you know, you're fooling with the development of the brain and uh, the parts that uh, are involved with rational thought and, and stuff like that as well too. So when we have that concern at the college level here too, and people have that availability, that's a that's a, a big uh, a red flag for us as well too. So, but I see that uh, the prescription drugs are a problem because they're so easy and they're so available, and the internet uh, powder form combinations. But uh, they got all the drugs that we had as a concern, and then they throw all these uh, synthetic drugs and the availability, the cost, the purity, pure purity and then the combinations that's a, that's what I see changes most of it. and this stuff is so dangerous now that uh, even though you think you're young and vulnerable we're look at the look at the statistics <laughs> like, you know 64,000 people overdose death every year when I taught this class 20 years it was 4,000 you know 6,000 64,000 and they're projecting more for 2000 these are the 2016 stats for 2007 they're projecting more of that as well too and uh, Heroin is a concern, oxy is a concern. Fentanyl now is the, I had a, I had a speaker today at my, in my class and she's an EMT and she was telling us the story. I saw it on news too, where the police officer stopped a, a group of young men who were using and they had fentanyl in there. So he was kind of looking over the thing and he had his gloves on, you know, and uh, he saw, thought, thought it was kind of powder and he was actually fentanyl, but his gloves on was okay. And as he got out and they were talking to the other police officers, one police officer said, what's that on your shirt? <laughs> And the was what? And when he reached over, a little bit of that fentanyl got on his shirt, and, and all he did, he had his gloves off. He go, oh. He overdosed from that and fentanyl, and it took him five injections of Narcan to bring him back. Uh, three on site, one in the emergency room, and one uh, uh, when he got transferred to. It, it's so powerful, and then that's that's fentanyl, you know, and all the other prescriptions. But now they got another drug you probably heard about is carfentanyl, which is. Uh, a hundred times more powerful than, than fentanyl itself, which drops those big elephants, you know, those, uh, you know, and, and uh, people are getting access to that on the, on the internet as well, too. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that we have to deal with, and much, much more, and the stakes are much, much higher. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to all of you. I think this was lays good groundwork for a lot of the issues around addiction and what we're doing, so I have all the production questions. And, and Will and Nate, feel free to chime in on the, the work you've been doing to yeah. organizations as well. I was just going to start uh, Xanax. You have students talk to you about that. I'm, I was curious thinking about Xanax and how it's that's another really normalized drug because it's not as extreme as opioids in the case of uh, overdoses. Uh, addiction, though, with Xanax is pretty extreme, however. And I was wondering, with students or just anybody taking Xanax like they do, 
um, does that kind of get them into that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Or they get used to, you know, just popping pills, you know what I mean? So then when opioids come along, would that necessarily make them more prone to take the opioids? Or how does that? Yeah, that's what that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Danix is one of the drugs too. In the last maybe five years, I've had several students say, Frank, I think you should do a lecture on, on Xanax. Mm-hmm. And I, I haven't done a lot of lecture on the benzodiazepines, you know, mm-hmm. Xanax, Valium, Librium, you know, medical, you know, that's a psychological drug yeah. too, and that's not my area. But um, the danger of Xanax too is that, like any other drug, it's a good drug, you know, if you follow the instructions and, mm-hmm. and for a, a period of time. But when, when it comes to drugs like Xanax, because it's a depressant drug, you know, like calming, mm-hmm. We used to call them sedatives back in our day, but they're they're sedatives, so they, they calm or slow down the central nervous system, as does heroin or opioids. And when you there's a cardinal sin when it comes to uh, misusing drugs. You never combine two depressants because both of them they not only occupy the opiate receptor sites and gives you that that feel good from the dopamine being rushed out, but it also uh, slows down your respiratory effect. So when you put two of those together, they call it synergism. Two might have the effect of ten. And we're seeing people uh, overdose with Xanax and alcohol. Xanax and some of those uh, more powerful opiate drugs. Uh, Heath Ledger is a good example of alcohol and, and, and uh, Xanax. And, uh, and we're seeing much more of that now with the benzodiazepines. Uh, when they first came out, they were supposed to be a safe alternative to, to the barbiturates, which a lot of people were dying from and overdosing from. Uh, but that was a myth. They, they were, people were overdosing from that. And then we're throwing it on to another uh, depressant drug. And we're having that concern as well, too. And then with any other drug, when you are younger and you're taking it more than you're supposed to or you're misusing it, mm-hmm. or we say using it offline or off-label, uh, the addiction can be much greater as well too. So, And once you develop a, a tolerance for Xanax, mm-hmm. that's gonna affect your tolerance when you're taking heroin as well too. It becomes a cross tolerance, becomes a very dangerous game as well. And we're seeing that younger and younger and younger, the college. And uh, even in high school, I get a question about, about Xanax now. Uh, but it depends what the answer comes. That actually leads me to my follow-up question with that. So, because, uh, you know, every you know decade or so, it's kind of shifted. You know, you had the ice and then mm-hmm. moved up. Was there a precursor then to the opioid crisis that's going on now? Like, was there some sort of red flags that happened, you know, 10 years ago or so? And are those same red flags uh, prevalent with Xanax? <laughs> that's a very good question here, too. Uh, and I, like I said, the Xanax and the Benzoid are a little bit out of my area. Maybe Mike can address that question. Yeah. Uh, but I, I will say this about the other drugs, though. Um, they call it, in, in, in the law enforcement field, they call it whacking the mole, which means that when a new drug comes out that's illegal, uh, they're going to, in law enforcement, going to arrest, you know, they're going to slam that down, what they did with meth and, and crack cocaine. But when you do that, when you clamp down on a drug, another drug is going to pop up. And that's what's happened with these opioids is that when they clamp down on heroin, when they clamp down on the other drugs, uh, because of the addiction or the feeling you're gonna get that, another drug is gonna pop up or another combination. And I think that's what happened on that illicit part. Uh, as far as the, the medical aspect, I'm gonna be careful of this too with my medical colleagues as well too, but boy, most people point to it just been overprescribed. It's just an easy thing to to prescribe it. Uh, it's and they, and they have a, they, there's a, in our field, in behavioral, uh, behavioral sciences too, it's called addiction by prescription. And you take Xanax or any of the opioids, they're so strong that if you were given a legitimate prescription for 30 days, you can get addicted in, easily in 30 days. You can get addicted probably on this stuff in maybe 12 days if you take it steady. I went in for some inf- uh, an infection on my wisdom teeth and uh, got a, it, it, I had an infection from getting wisdom teeth taken out. and. Uh, Pain I've never had before. They gave me everything: Percocet, morphine, uh, fentanyl. Was finally got me out of it. A little managed it too. But when I left there, the doctor gave me a prescription for I don't know how many hydrocodone, which I get in. My dentist gave me another one. I had, and I don't like taking. I'm, I'm kind of a guy that likes staying in control. I did. I only took probably two of them. But my sisters and relatives borrowed. Must have had 120 of those. Well, they're sixty dollars a pill, you know, on the street. And I had hundreds of them too, but they just took them and used them when they wanted to. But uh, it's, it was so easy, and I think that addiction by prescription. And uh, and then look at look at Prince, this, this most recent example of prescription drugs. And 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 he was a guy that didn't drink. He was a vegan. He was into healthy. He didn't use any. He he frowned on recreational use, so I'm sure he didn't smoke marijuana. But he had an addiction to. Uh, prescription drugs, and I think it was that fentanyl that you know the tolerance that he built up, and he had access to 
Dr. They think his name is Michael, ja Michael Jackson. He do the same thing with Adam and Nicole Smith, River Phoenix. It, it's the same pattern there too. So the whacking, the another drug is popping up. Uh, the benzos popped up when they clamped down on the barbiturates. So they got to handle on the barbiturates. So the other ones are popping up in the more powerful opiates too. But uh, but as far as the medical uh, uh, prescription, I'll, I'll leave that maybe to, to, to Mike. So that is halftime. We're going to cut the file in half there. So we've got about another 45 minutes of the rest of this event. And uh, if we don't have it be our episode next week, we will at least share the whole audio clip online. You can watch the rest online, mm -hmm. I think. We'll, we'll make that decision soon. But the rest of it's really good. I think it, it gets better on the second half, actually. But I also liked hearing the... Uh, the introduction of Michael and Frank in, in this half and uh, especially Michael's explanation of what the city is up to as far as uh, planning these harm reduction things. What do you, I mean, I, I was really excited when I first heard about that. I mean, he was describing they want to build a robust system for treatment, mm -hmm. including Suboxone providing yeah, that in was, Grand Forks. That was very encouraging to hear that, that that sort of tone, that harm reduction tone is gaining a little momentum even within the realm of, you know, the city. Uh, local legislators and stuff like that are even kind of catching this uh, general idea of what harm reduction is and, you know, sort of why it's important. Uh, one thing in the discussion that really, you know, popped into my mind uh that I think a lot of viewers and a lot of people in general that are not super, you know, well, f super familiar with harm reduction and drug use in general, uh, I think one big question that will come to people's minds is, you know, why should, why should we help these opioid users stop their withdrawals? You know, why does that matter? Why is it important to help them stop withdrawals? And that's a good question. I, um, I can see how people wonder that, you know, I mean, I would likely even have wondered that kind of thing before I had ever uh, experienced what addiction was firsthand. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it's really important because uh, they, mentioned, they mentioned during the discussion that people will resort to just about anything to avoid those withdrawals. You know, I mean, the withdrawals don't typically, from heroin and opioids, the, the withdrawals don't typically kill its users, but they are so uncomfortable that users will oftentimes resort to just about anything to avoid that withdrawal. And I think that's the answer that's as the to answer. why, I mean, to the question when my, I'm going to say my parents or somebody ask, why would you ever do heroin, you know, or, or something? Why, you know, they just can't fathom somebody making that decision. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the people that make that decision are ones who are feeling the withdrawals from right. their other opioid sources that now they can't get or don't have available yeah so that's what yeah they say they'll do anything the first time i ever really experienced somebody who's going through withdrawals was when i was at a music festival in colorado um this guy was hanging out with us and whatever he's fine and the second day he was totally sick and i let him lay down in our tent and he, he slept in, in our tent all day he was so sick that, I mean, I'd never seen anyone so in so much pain. Like, mm -hmm. if this dude's mother would have seen him right there, I mean, if she's anything like my mother, she she would have done anything. Yeah. To to fix this, you know, anything, because it was just horrible to watch, and like he's not faking it, you know, like this is a physical reaction. And um, what happened was he had to have a friend come up from Denver to pick him up, bring him home, so he could. Medi medicate himself he like he, he he said too he's like i'm going through withdrawals right now like i thought i was going to be okay for the weekend but i am i overestimated myself and i am really feeling it and i don't have any medicine with me wow he himself underestimated the power of the withdrawal yeah wow. he, he knew that like it was a possibility but he was confident in his in his ability to be okay this weekend but he was wrong mm -hmm. and so he had to have a friend pick him up drive him all the way home to medicate himself and then he drove all the way back for the last day because he had a weekend pass and he was totally fine on the last day totally fine not high or anything you know just like his withdrawals had been cured and he was able to be himself but um just to, that was a good experience to me because i finally understood what withdrawals mean 
And I mean, think about it. If you have a, a, a children or like, you know, a job or anything that you got to go at, go be at to survive. Yep. And you, you can't be there because you're feeling bad. I mean, I totally get why you would resort to doing something dangerous. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the answer to this question. Why should we, why should everybody care about helping these people? And the answer is because the, you know, people addicted to opioids will resort to nearly anything to avoid that withdrawal. And as you pointed out, this guy, you know, once he, once he got his medication, he was able to function normally. Yeah. He was able to like function normally. And, you know, you mentioned, um, they could go, they could go to their job. They could, you know, do their <laughs> normal things once they have this, uh, the opioid receptors in their brain and body filled. And that's why things like Suboxone and Methadone and just opioid treatment in general and drug treatment in general is so important because, um, you know, you can help people function normally in society that otherwise uh, would not be. They'd be resorting to anything to avoid those withdrawals. You know what else I really liked about this conversation was how Michael was talking about how he he uses Reddit, the yeah. opiate subreddit. So Reddit, you know, is a website. It's like a community, online community building kind of website. And there's different categories you can kind of subscribe to. And you often get really sincere stories and information from people on certain really specific topics. So Michael was saying he uses the opiate subreddit. And he is a part of that community or at least listens to reads what's going on there. And <laughs> that he, this is how he's learned, you know, a lot about the drug community and how people are trying to educate themselves and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Really great how he is clearly taking, seeing value in drug users' perspectives yeah. on drug use. Because, yeah, last year, you know, our video was kind of critical of the fact that it seemed that the city was, I mean, one person on the panel who said, we should not listen to drug users because they're biased right, in right. a conversation about legalizing or regulating drugs. And, <laughs> and But now here, this new city employee who is the Opiate Response Project Coordinator probably had on his resume that he is aware of the subreddit opiates mm-hmm. and he you know deliberately uses these online sources to communicate and learn from the stories of drug users yeah, is a really good sign. That's very encouraging. Yeah, like to have that sort of inside perspective, like he, he invested his time, got on this Reddit and, uh, you know, was, was educating himself about drug users and their perspectives and stuff. And that, that was very encouraging to hear that he is involved in, uh, in the community. And so, you know, he's, he's a, he has a little bit of impact on the way this, the tone is changing. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. Our questions, I think we'll get to more of that in part two or the rest of this clip is we ask him about the tone of these events and mm-hmm. he says, I mean, so he's new to this, right? Like he lives in Fargo. He's just been commuting up. He just started the job last month. Oh, okay. And so he's got this grant and he's put in charge of a lot of stuff. He's learning a lot. He's figuring out what his role is, I think. And they all are. Um, but it's, yeah. So he wasn't around last year for these other events. You yeah. know, all the other people on the panel and in his group, I think, were. And, you know, he's just a part of the team now. And so he's learning about what the tone is. I mean... I really like his tone and yeah. I like how he was able to talk at this thing and he seemed open and sincere and really cool. And, and there were some other city folks there who were, um, you know, totally vibing off of him too. So yeah, that's super cool to see like from last <laughs> year, don't listen to drug addicts when thinking about drug policy. And then here this year, this guy is doing the exact opposite. He's like, no, we need to consider, you know, drug usage and, and the inside perspective. Yeah. And I think it seems that the rest of the city crew and, and the whole mayor's call to action and all that are really behind him and behind a tone like that. That's um, wonderful. I mean, they hired him, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just met him, you know, maybe we don't know him uh, that well either, but I got good feelings about it all. Wonderful. Um, so Frank, wonderful. In this thing, he described what the word epidemic means. Yeah. In the same way he explained to us what psychedelic means, psych, the psyche of the mind, and delic, uh, uh, expanding or manifesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, you know, the psychedelic club is about expanding our minds and all that. He taught us that. I liked how he said about epidemic. Epi means upon or around, and demic refers to the people. 
So there's just something upon or around the people, and that is the epidemic we've been calling this drug epidemic. Um, but it just got me thinking, like, Maybe there could be a good epidemic. Something good yeah. can be upon and around the people too, right? <laughs> it, feels, it feels like that's catching on, that there is sort of this movement of goodness, this movement of uh, you know, uh, genuinely involving yourself in this Reddit, you know, like this, like this guy did, Michael did. What if it's a psychedelic epidemic? <laughs> <laughs> a mind-expanding epidemic. All around the people. That's good. That's a good thing. It feels like a, things are going well. Momentum is like going forward in a good, positive way. Well, thank you all for listening. This has been the third episode of the Harm Reduction Report. Uh, you can catch us live every Tuesday mornings at 88.3 FM KEQQ Grand Forks uh, or online, our Facebook, the UND Psychedelic Club Facebook page or uh, sandbaggernews.org. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know, I guess, if we'll have part two on next week or go somewhere else, but uh, we'll we'll let you know. <laughs> uh, excited to see you again. Thank you all, and uh, sandbag on. Thanks. Your pal Cal here signing off. Thanks for having me, Will. Toodaloo.